This morning we left off uh, with Paul the Persecutor and uh, how in his enthusiasm for Judaism and Phariseeism he had tried to annihilate the church, had tried to exterminate the following of Jesus Christ, had battled against the name of the Lord Jesus. And as he described himself, uh, we have the word obsession in the uh, NIV, but consistent with other translations. Uh, the word obsession in his self-description, my obsession against him, he went even, even with foreign cities, he said, with letters to arrest those who were following the Lord, that he participated in arresting and imprisoning and condemning to death multiple followers of Christ. We have no idea how many, uh, but uh, more than one by his own testimony. And so in 1 Timothy 1, 12, 13, which we were looking at, thinking about both in John's class and in my class earlier, I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord, who has given me strength, that he considered me faithful, appointing me to his service, even though I was once a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent man. I was shown mercy because I acted in ignorance and unbelief. Now, the ignorance and unbelief there doesn't mean he had a lack of information. Information was available, but he had a lack of comprehension. And to some extent, that was related to the condition of his own heart, to his own stubbornness and unwillingness to hear those ideas and, uh, and consider the implications of them. He, I would suppose, like a lot of his fellow Jews, uh, he says that to the Jews, the, uh, the cross was a stumbling block. I would suppose that a lot of, like a lot of his fellow Jews, he had a problem with the idea of a humiliated and weak Messiah, of a suffering Messiah, of a crucified Messiah. Cursed is everyone that hangs on the tree. Uh, and that did not fit into his expectations any more than it did the expectations of a lot of his fellow Jews in that time and in that era. Um, we're going to talk about Paul's transformation here, blinded by the light, but I'm going to just touch on a question that was given to me uh, about the synagogue because I've already spent a little time talking about the synagogue and that system and so forth, and, and mentioned how Ananias was uh, a Christian in, there in the ninth chapter of Acts, well, the ninth chapter, yeah, the ninth chapter of Acts, when, when Ananias is told to go to Paul, to go to Saul, in the story that we're uh, looking at here momentarily, uh, Ananias enjoyed a good reputation among the Jews, and there's every reason to suppose he continued to move in the circles of Judaism as a believer. And so the question was, was given to me, are there instances of the first century church meeting at the synagogue in the text? I, as I said, the word synagogue, like the word church, came to be identified with the meeting place, as well as with the group that met there, uh, as has happened with the word church in our own language. When you say church, you mean the place or you mean the people. Biblically, we should mean the people. Frequently, folks use the word to mean the place. And so also with the, with the term synagogue. Well, there's an instance, that, there's aspects of this that turn up several times in the stories in the New Testament, the book of Acts in particular. But there's an instance in the 18th chapter of Acts in Corinth. After Paul left Athens and went to Corinth, he found a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to leave Rome, and he went to see them. And because he was of the same trade, he stayed with them and worked, for they were tent makers by trade. And he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and tried to persuade Jews and Greeks. When Silas and Timothy arrived from Macedonia, Paul was occupied with the word, with the word, testifying to the Jews that Christ was Jesus. And when they opposed and reviled him, he shook out his garments and said to them, Your blood be on your own heads, I'm innocent. From now on I will go to the Gentiles. And he left there and went to the house of a man named Titus Justice a worshiper of God. His house was next door to the synagogue. And Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue, believed in the Lord, together with his entire household and many of the Corinthians 
hearing Paul believe and were baptized. And it goes on to say that the Lord told Paul, I've got a lot more for you to do here. And Paul stayed a year and a half and so forth. But Paul was teaching in the synagogue every Sabbath. And Christians were meeting together once this church got started. And it sounds like, I don't, I'm not saying that definitely this is true, but it sounds like they were using the synagogue facility. The reason it sounds like that to me is because it says that after Paul and after Silas and Timothy came from Macedonia, there's a dust up with the Jews, and Paul moved next door to this house that was next to the synagogue and uh, was using that then as his base of operations. But it sounds like he was using the synagogue the facility there as his base of teaching operations before that, maybe including Lord's Day assemblies with those who became believers. Not, you know, Sabbath was the Jewish thing, but Sunday, the first day of the week, the day of resurrection was the Christian thing. So it may be that sometimes when we had a number of people in the synagogue who became believers, that they just used those facilities until it became a problem. And in a lot of the stories of Paul, it became a problem. Uh, very often they ended up having to go separate ways, but, but there probably were instances, and Corinth sounds like one, where at least for a time, they were able to cohabit and, and share facilities. Uh, it, it seems like that may be what's being described by this there. But I wouldn't want to be too definitive about that because uh, it's, a, it's an interpretation of the text and not necessarily just uh, completely clear what Luke tells us there. We had Paul the persecutor. We had this, this man who was obsessed with his Pharisaic predictions, his convictions about the law, who was doing his best to annihilate the followers of Jesus, to end the following of the law. And uh, so we come to Acts 9, 3 through 9, where Paul now has letters to the synagogues, to the leaders of the synagogues in Damascus, and uh, plural from the previous passage we looked at here, more than one synagogue in Damascus. And as he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him, he fell to the ground, and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Well, in fact, he says that he was trying to destroy the name, that he was battling against the name of Jesus of Nazareth. Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I'm Jesus and you're persecuting me, replied. Now get up and go into the city and you will be told what you must do. And then traveling with Saul stood there speechless. They heard the sound but did not see anyone. Saul got up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand into Damascus. For three days he was blind, and he did not eat or drink anything. Now, it's often referred to Paul being converted on the Damascus road. I don't really see that or describe it that way. But Paul had an awakening on the Damascus road. He was blinded by the light, and he had a change, yes, a change of worldview because of what happened on the Damascus road. But he was told, go into the city, and you'll be told what you must do. And so as with others, you know, on the day of Pentecost, when those folks said, men and brethren, what shall we do? And Peter answered their Acts 2, 37 and 38, uh, and told them what they needed to do on account of their newfound conviction that Jesus is to be obeyed and followed. Well, Paul may have had the conviction that Jesus is Lord here on the road to Damascus, but go into the city and you'll be told what you must do. And so, indeed, he went into the city. And uh, he had to be led by the hand because he couldn't see anything. He was three days, we're told, blind and didn't eat or drink anything during that time. Now this story is retold by Paul and I originally had slides look at all three of the stories and I said, you know what, I want to finish this before the two weeks are over. So I'll just put note that, that Paul retells these stories and a couple times I've already referred to portions of his account of what happened. In Acts 22, when he's addressing the mob in Jerusalem, in, in the area of the temple, Acts 22, 3 through 11, he retells this story. And again, when Paul was in front of Agrippa and Festus, Paul retold the story another time in Acts 26, 9 through 19. And he doesn't necessarily emphasize the same points each of those times, Luke's telling of it and Paul's retelling of it. There are different points that are brought out uh, in, the, in the story along the way. But for the moment, I'm going to be content with, uh, with the telling of it here. That Paul had an experience with the Lord there on the Damascus Road. He had a conversation with Jesus Christ on the Damascus Road. And it led him to believe, yes, but he was still to be told what he had to do. To go into the city and be told what he had to do. And so Paul underwent a transformation. 
by the grace of God and underwent a transformation. He speaks of this transformation in 1 Corinthians 15, 9 through 11. And I'm not omitting the conversion. I'm just not spending time on that right here at the moment. He was told by Ananias what to do. He did obey the Lord's command. He was baptized, calling on the name of the Lord, washing away his sins. Uh, all of those things occurred as according to the Lord's plan. But Paul, in talking about these things that happened that changed him, in 1 Corinthians 15, 9 through 11, he says, I am the least of the apostles and do not even deserve to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace to me was not without effect. No, I work harder than all of them, yet not I. But the grace of God that was with me, whether it then, whether then it was I or they, this is what we preach, this is what you believe. And he's referring back to the previous verses where he talks about the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, how he was crucified according to the Scriptures, he was buried according to the Scriptures, he was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures, and there were multiple reliable witnesses and testimonies to that, last of all being himself, that he was one out of due season who saw that. So he's an apostle. The least of the apostles, but an apostle nevertheless. And with the full authority of apostleship. And he calls himself least, not because of his work, because he says, I work harder than anybody else. And that was not braggadocio. That was conviction. He believed he needed to work hard to get the job done, to share the gospel. He had a strong compulsion and conviction about getting the message out. But he attributes what he was and what he did to the grace of God. And that's a theme that I, I want to follow through on a few more passages where Paul talks about himself and being an apostle of Jesus Christ because he emphasizes very strongly this idea that it was by the grace of God. Not by his determination. It was by the Lord's choice and by God's command, by the will of God that he became an apostle. But he emphasizes over and over again that it was God's grace to him. His grace to me was not without effect. Grace is not merely acceptance by God. Grace did something to Paul. Grace transformed Paul. Grace made him into something he had not previously been and would not have been on his own. He became something, something useful, something valuable, someone with purpose in life. He thought he had a purpose in life. His purpose in life was redefined. He became something different, something useful in the plan of God by the grace of God. It was God in him, the grace of God in him, and so he preaches the gospel because of God's grace. Back in Galatians 1, 15 through 17, we have Paul talking about, again, how he became an apostle. It was the revelation of Jesus Christ. It wasn't what anyone said to him. It was not the, uh, he did not receive the gospel from men, but rather from God. So he says in Galatians 1, 15 through 17, When God, who set me apart from birth and called me by his grace, was pleased to reveal his son in me, so that I might preach him among the Gentiles, I did not consult any man. Nor did I go up to Jerusalem to see those who were apostles before I was, but I went immediately into Arabia and later returned to Damascus. So again, God set me apart and called me by His grace. God called me by His grace so that I might preach Him among the Gentiles. Paul attributed his position in life to grace. And Paul, in the book of Ephesians in particular, has much to say about grace. The, grace, the word grace turns up over and over again in Ephesians. And in Ephesians 4, 7, he says that grace has been given to every one of us, to every Christian. He has a portion to each one of us grace. Who? Well, Christ. Christ has a portion to each of us grace. And the idea is there that every one of us in our calling and being called to follow the Lord, and if he doesn't call us, we can't answer, we can't come to him without being invited, but he does invite us. And if we accept his call, he gives us the grace to become something in his family, to be of use in his church. And Paul goes on there in Ephesians 4, 7 and following. He talks about how Christ apportioned grace. He talks about how Jesus came down and how Jesus went up, how he is greatly exalted. And when he went up, he gave gifts to men. And then we have 4.11, Ephesians 4.11, where he gave some to be apostles and some to be prophets and some to be evangelists and some to be pastors and teachers. And those are the functional offices that we recognize in the church, that God gave men to fill those positions for the leadership of the church to prepare God's people for works of service. Not to do the work of service, but to prepare God's people for works of service so that we could all grow into maturity in Christ, that we could all grow up in the Lord. 
And the idea that Paul says, God's grace made something of me. And he says, God's grace makes something of every one of his children. There's a place in the body for you. By the grace of God, there is value, there is purpose, there is function. In your life as a Christian, you have a role to fill. Paul had a role to fill by the grace of God. He called me by his grace and was pleased to reveal his son to me. He had something for Paul to do. Well, if you have heard God's call and become a follower of Jesus Christ, he has purpose for your life as well. He has things for you to do by his grace. Now, in that passage that was just up there, Paul said he went away to Arabia. And so I have an addendum here on Arabia, because yesterday I made an off the cuff comment uh, that I thought Paul went to Mount Sinai, and it was just, you know, completely theory. But somebody asked about that. Okay, why do you say that? And so here, this is why I say that. He says in Galatians 1.17... I did, nor did I go up to Jerusalem to see those who were apostles before I was, but I went immediately into Arabia and later returned to Damascus. And the next verse says, and then after three years he went down to Jerusalem. So why did Paul go to Arabia? Well, maybe to be shown the revelations that he talks about. And to see these things from the, from the scriptures, from the prophets. To see Christ in prophecy and have that unfolded in his mind to see Christ the man, what Jesus had done. Maybe to be shown those revelations from Scripture and by the Spirit for three years. Three years being a coincidental period of time because how long did Jesus spend with his disciples preparing them for ministry? Well, it was three years, wasn't it? Jesus spent about three years with his disciples. And and I think that there's more than coincidence here. I think that, that God is being consistent in his dealing with Paul. He didn't just, you know, that day he took Paul and gave him a good shake and dumped it all into his head and that was that. I don't think so. I think that Paul also had to apprehend these things, had to learn these things as the Spirit revealed them to him, had to take them into himself. And so, for three years, he did this, according to the passage there in Galatians 1, 17 and 18. And where did Paul go in Arabia? And this is speculative, take it as no more than speculation, but in the same letter, in chapter 4, verse 25, Paul says, Now Hagar stands from Mount Sinai in Arabia, which corresponds to the present city of Jerusalem, because she is in slavery with her children. Okay, We have, the, we have Arabia mentioned in the New Testament exactly here and here. This is, this is where Arabia comes up. Paul says, I went into Arabia, and then a couple chapters later we have him saying that, that uh, Jerusalem in its current state in rebellion against God is like Hagar, which stands from Mount Sinai, which is in Arabia. This is the one place we have that reference to, that Mount Sinai is in Arabia. And if you went to the Holy Land, if you went to Israel, and were shown Mount Sinai, it wouldn't be in Arabia, because the traditional Mount Sinai that people visit today, where the monastery of St. Catherine is and all that, it's not the mountain that the Jews were, that the Israelites went to. But, but Paul still knew where it was. Its location was lost when the Israelites were defeated by the Romans in uh, 70 AD, and then again in 135, uh, 138 AD, in the second Jewish revolt, the Bar Kokhba revolt, and they were banned from the land, banned from Judea. And the knowledge of the location of Mount Sinai fell by the wayside, and no one knows for sure. There are interesting candidates for the location of Mount Sinai, but Paul says it was in Arabia. And the fact that he mentions that he went into Arabia, and then he mentions Arabia and slavery here, makes me think, well, maybe one of the places, at least maybe he spent a little time where Moses and Elijah spent a little time communing with the Lord. I don't know that. I just I just think it's a possibility that uh, Paul went to Mount Sinai while he was in Arabia during that three years of schooling before he took up preaching in, indeed as an apostle of Jesus Christ, went down to Jerusalem and met the representatives there of the authority figures that were available at that time. Now, Paul said in Galatians 1, 15 through 17, God set me apart from my mother's womb. And I think that's kind of an interesting thing for him to say. Is this audacious or what? God set me apart from my mother's womb. You know, when I was a youngster, I had a feeling that God had set me apart, that God had a purpose for my life. Is that audacious to think that way? There was a guy named Jeremiah who said, The word of the Lord came to me, Jeremiah 1, 4, and 5. The word of the Lord came to me saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Was that unique to Jeremiah? Is Jeremiah the only one that the Lord knew in the womb as he was being formed? Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Isn't that true of everyone? Doesn't he know everyone in the womb? We have other scriptures that speak to that idea that God knows us even before we're born. And before you were born, I consecrated you. I have appointed you a prophet to the nations. 
So what Paul says when, when he makes this assertion in Galatians, he's putting himself on the same level, the same plane, if you will, as Jeremiah the prophet, that he is an instrument of God. Well, folks, we should all be instruments of God. God looked at us as we were being formed. God looked at what we could be, at what we ought to be. And God has a purpose in mind for us. The grace of God, he has a purpose in mind for our lives in his service. And uh, it doesn't have to be some great and exalted thing. Actually, neither Jeremiah nor Paul felt like they were in a great and exalted position. They were in a position of servitude that was often very humiliating, often very difficult and very dangerous. Both of them went through many hardships and threats against their life in their service to God. So it wasn't a great and exalted position in any sense that men would ordinarily recognize. But it was an exalted position because it was in the service of God. God said to Jeremiah, I'm going to give you words to speak and you're going to tell these people and they're not going to listen to you. But tell them anyway. Tell them what I say. And God wants his people to do that. God wants us to have a sense of his grace and his purpose in our lives that we're here for a reason. We have things that need to be said. We know things that need to be shared. We may be up against a monolithic worldview that is in complete contradiction to what we believe, but we have a purpose in this world just as surely as Jeremiah did and as surely as Paul did. You may not be called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ, but you are called to be a servant of Christ. And he has a purpose for you. If you are living and breathing, he has things for you to do in the service of his kingdom. Set apart before birth. Now Paul, again, was transformed by grace. Ephesians 3, 1 through 3. For this reason I, Paul, was prisoner of Christ Jesus. And literally at this time, when he's writing Ephesians, he is a prisoner in Rome, waiting for trial. A prisoner of Christ Jesus for the sake of you Gentiles. Well, that's kind of blaming, isn't it? It's your fault I'm in here? It's because of you Gentiles that I'm in jail. Well, it's literally true. It's literally true. Because when he was in the temple and the riot started, it was because some of the Jews from Asia had seen him earlier in the city with Trophimus the Ephesian, an Asian Gentile who was a believer. And knowing Paul and knowing Trophimus, say that they had run-ins with him before in Asia, they raised an uproar. Paul's in the temple. He brought Gentiles into the temple. Well, he didn't. But that was the uproar. And when Paul was standing on the steps defending his apostleship and defending Jesus Christ in the 22nd chapter of Acts, they listened to him until he got to the part where the Lord said, I am sending you to the Gentiles. And then the uproar started all over again. The man is not fit to live, they were shouting. So literally, he was a prisoner on account of you Gentiles, a prisoner for the sake of you Gentiles. Surely you have heard about the administration of God's grace that was given to me for you. God's grace given to me for you. He didn't look at his being a prisoner and say, well, this is a wretched turn of events. He looked at it and said, this is part of God's plan to send me to the Gentiles. This is part of what God had in mind for me. And the mystery was made known to me by revelation. Again, the mystery that he got by revelation. Okay? The mystery made known to me by revelation, as I have already written briefly. So God gave him a job to do. And that job was in the nations, among the nations. And that job put him in a position where he was in danger, where his life was threatened, where his freedom was taken away. And unlike his Jewish accusers who said, before Jesus was crucified, we have no king but Caesar, and who said, when Paul was on trial there in the book of Acts, um, again, we have no king, he preaches Christ as king, we have no king but Caesar. Paul says, yes, we do. We have another king. Jesus Christ is king. And what Caesar does here is within the scope of the will of Jesus Christ. That his position was not because Caesar was in any way trumping Christ or had authority that Christ could not contravene. But this was Christ's purpose all along. That Paul was in a place that Christ wanted him to be. And that as a prisoner, he was still fulfilling the will and purpose of Jesus Christ. And in his prison letters, particularly Ephesians and Colossians, we have this exalted Christology in the opening chapters of both of those books talking about the supremacy of Christ, the headship of Christ over all things, how every authority in heaven and earth is subject to him, how God unifies everything in Jesus Christ. His position as a prisoner did not in the slightest diminish his confidence in the power and the wisdom of the Jesus that he met on the road to Damascus and decided to follow. He believed that Jesus knew what he was doing in his own life as well as in the cosmic scheme of things. And so in Ephesians chapter 3, continuing down in verses 7 through 10, Paul says, I became a servant of this gospel 
by the gift of God's grace, given me through the working of His power. Although I am less than the least of all God's people, not just less than the apostles, but less than everybody, even if I am the bottom rung on the ladder of God's people, this grace was given me to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. This is a gift of God. I get to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of God. That's why I'm a prisoner. But it's God's gift. The grace of God has put him in this position to preach to the nations the unsearchable riches of Christ and make plain to everyone the administration of this ministry that God has brought this into being, that he's made it available to everyone, that he has put a structure in place in the church to fulfill this will and this purpose, which for ages past was kept hidden in God who created all things. His faith was certainly undiminished. He firmly believed in the grace of God. Going back to this passage you've seen several times now, in 1 Timothy, between a couple different classes here. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 12 through 17. Paul again says, I thank Christ Jesus our Lord. And just a side comment. I thank Christ Jesus our Lord. That's okay to talk to Christ. Right? Paul did. I thank Christ Jesus our Lord. It's, a, it's just an aside. But, but Paul had a number of conversations with the Lord as, a, as, a, as his disciple. I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who has given me strength. So what strength did Paul work with? It was the strength of Christ, not the strength of Paul. The, the various descriptions of Paul, he himself says, you know, people say that my physical appearance, he says that I, I don't have a good, good mannerism and speech. People say his presence is weak. He writes strong letters, but he's not all that imposing or impressive in person. Well, he says in that context, in 2 Corinthians as well as this context, that it's, it's the strength of Christ that carries him along. He considered me faithful, appointing me to his service. Even though I was once a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent man, I was shown mercy because I acted in ignorance and unbelief. The grace of our Lord was poured out on me abundantly. The grace of our Lord was poured out on me abundantly, along with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. So Paul was transformed by this grace. He continues on. Here's a trustworthy saying, and John this was over this passage here this morning. There's several trustworthy sayings, things that were common to remember among the, the brethren. Here's a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. That's the trustworthy saying. Paul's addendum to that is, of which I am the worst. Um, yeah. He saw himself in the light of being one who had violated the purposes of God horribly before he came into this place of knowing the grace and submitting to the will of God. But for that very reason I was shown mercy, so that in me, the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus might display his unlimited patience as an example for those who would believe on him and receive eternal life. Now to the King, eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, the honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Paul believed that Jesus Christ, working in him, was the basis of what he did, was the basis of his success, the basis of his relationship with God, the basis of his forgiveness, that he had received in Christ things that he could never do or achieve for himself. And because of that, he worked hard. Because he saw that as motivational indication of what God had in mind for him in his life. He worked hard at serving the Lord. He was shown mercy. And consequently, he turned around, you know, like in the story of the unmerciful servant. The unmerciful servant who had a huge debt, and when he appealed to the master, the master said, all right, I will write that debt off. And he went out and found a man who owed a piddling amount, just a few, a few dollars equivalent, and, and uh, was determined that this man should repay what he owed or else be thrown into prison. And, and the, the master of both heard about that and said, well, if that's your attitude, then you're going to have to repay the, the full amount yourself. You know? and, and Paul had that perspective that with what the Lord has done for me, there's nothing beyond the pale of what I should do for others. And so he gave himself to the work of the Lord. He was shown mercy to be, and John already commented on this very effectively this morning, he was shown mercy as an example of the mercy of Christ that no one could look and say, well, it's too late for me. If it wasn't too late for Paul, it isn't too late for anyone. Anyone who will come to terms, anyone who will believe in the Lord, anyone who will repent of their sins, it isn't too late. If you can do that, if you can repent, if you can accept the grace of God, it isn't too late. Paul said he was the extreme example of that. And so, back to the story of the conversion of Paul in Acts chapter 9, 17 through 19. Ananias went to the house 
You remember the story, Ananias didn't much want to go to the house because he heard about Paul, he heard about him coming, uh, he was in dread of Paul. But Ananias, because the Lord insisted, he went to the house and entered it, and placing his hands on Saul, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here, has sent me, so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately something like scales fell from Saul's eyes, and he could see again. He got up and was baptized, and after taking some food, he regained his strength. So there were multiple purposes to the visit of Ananias, right? One of the purposes was Saul's salvation, that his sin death be removed. Another of those purposes was that he might see again. And another of those purposes, which goes hand in hand with the removal of his sins, was that he might receive the Holy Spirit. And again and again in his ministry, he attributes what he did to revelation from the Holy Spirit and working by the power of the Holy Spirit. But he needed to come to terms with the Lord, on the Lord's own terms, by getting up and being baptized in order to receive what the Lord would give him and fill him with, that you might be filled with the Holy Spirit. And so Saul got up and was baptized, ate some food, regained his strength, went away to Arabia, spent some time, three years all together in Arabia and Damascus, and then uh, went down to Jerusalem. Titus chapter 3, Paul refers to when he was converted, when he became a Christian. Titus chapter 3 and verses 3 through 8, Paul says, at one time we too were foolish. Anyone know what the difference? Well, there's a lot of differences, but primary difference between Paul and Titus was? Jew and Gentile, yeah. Paul was a Jew, Titus was a Gentile, okay? Um, we know that from Galatians, the second chapter. We'll get around to that passage later on. But Titus was a Greek. And so when Paul says, we were foolish, disobedient, deceived, and enslaved by all kinds of passions and pleasures, Paul the Jew and Titus the Greek both had the same problem. Paul talks about this at length in the first three chapters of Romans. It's a sin problem. Everyone alike, whether under the law or just following their own conscience, everyone has a sin problem. And so Paul and Titus, the Jew and the Gentile, they had a sin problem, same kind of problem, and they were caught up in the passions and pleasures. Now Paul's passions and Titus's might have been very different. Paul had a passion for exterminating Christians. I don't know what Titus's passions were, but they had probably different passions. But they both were driven by their passions. We lived in malice and envy, we hated and hating one another. And that always has made me wonder, but it's only wondering, don't give any more than that, has made me wonder if they knew each other before they became Christians. Hating, hated and hated. Does he, does he need us on a personal level? We don't know when Titus comes into the story. He and Paul may have known each other in Cilicia. They may have known each other in Tarsus. Because Luke never mentions Titus. He never talks about him. Even though we know that Titus was a fellow traveler with Paul in some of the trips. We know that Titus went to Jerusalem with Paul. Luke doesn't mention that. So Luke never brings Titus into his story. We don't know how long he traveled with Paul. We know he was a very trusted co-worker. And Paul really commended him for the things that he did in the service of the Lord. But we don't know how long they knew each other. But when I, when I read this about living in malice and envy, being hated and hating one another, is that a generalization of Jew and Gentile, or is that a specific that they were in conflict before Jesus changed the picture. I don't know. But when the kindness and love of God our Savior appeared, He saved us, both the Jew and the Gentile, the Apostle and the Evangelist. He saved us, not because of righteous things we had done, but because of His mercy. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit. And I think that a Christian reading washing of rebirth naturally thinks of what happens when you are baptized, not the washing away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of the good conscience for God. He saved us with this washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit, becoming something we had not been before, having a life we had not lived before. Renewal by the Holy Spirit will be poured out on us generously. See, when Paul talks about new birth, he's talking about a genuine transformation, not just a kind of a superficial, well, yesterday I wasn't a Christian, today I am but a genuine new beginning of life. The old things have passed away, the new things have come. We have been transformed because of His mercy and because of the working of the Holy Spirit, the washing of rebirth, renewal by the Holy Spirit, whom He poured out on us generously, not just me, but us, the believers, the followers of God, through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that having been justified by His grace, again, grace was fundamental to Paul's perception of what God 
had done in him, for him, and through him. Having been justified by his grace, we might become heirs, having the hope of eternal life. So Paul talks about this renewal and rebirth, which he experienced, but really is not uniquely his. Really, Titus had a similar kind of experience, and Jews and Gentiles who come to the Lord have this sort of transformation, this new beginning. And he is an extreme example of it. He certainly is an extreme example of it, but not a unique example of the change that becoming a follower of Christ can bring to human life. And so, we have him, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, renewed, transformed, made an apostle to the Gentiles by the grace of God. First Timothy 2, 5-7, through Paul says, There is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all men, the testimony given in its proper time. And for this purpose, I also, for this purpose, I was appointed a herald and an apostle, a messenger of Jesus Christ, an official spokesman for Jesus Christ. The word apostle, I think we know, is not an official word, it's not an ecclesiastical word, it's not a special use word, it's an ordinary word, and it means a messenger, but it really means a messenger who's sent out with particular mission or authority. If a king sent an apostle to another king, that emissary would have the authority to speak for the king who sent him, to represent him, to be an ambassador, to speak with the authority of the one who sent him. And so Paul says, I was appointed a herald. I, I declare the news the Lord has given me, and one sent with authority, an apostle, uh, sent out by God. I'm telling the truth, I'm not lying, and a teacher of the true faith to the Gentiles. So he's reminding Timothy of his own identity and authority, and then he goes on, of course, to remind Timothy of some of the responsibilities that he would have there in Ephesus, finishing up work that had been incomplete when Paul had left. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 1 and 2, Paul says, Am I not free? Am I not an apostle? Have I not seen Jesus our Lord? Had he seen Jesus our Lord? Well, at the very least, he had experienced him on the road to Damascus, but I don't think that's by any means the only time that he saw Jesus the Lord. There are numerous accounts where Paul talks about things that the Lord had told him or revealed to him. Sometimes Paul says the Lord sent an angel to show him something, but Paul had seen the Lord. He describes himself in 1 Corinthians 15 and 8 as a witness of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And that's part of what qualifies him to be an apostle. Not just the fact that he was sent by the Lord, but he was a witness to the reality of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. He could testify that Jesus lives, that Jesus rose from the dead. Have I not seen the Lord? Seen Jesus our Lord? Are you not the result of my work in the Lord? Even though I may not be an apostle to others, surely I am to you, for you are the seal of my apostleship in the Lord. Now, there's a little bit of defensiveness there, and I don't mean that in a negative way, but there were people who would say of Paul, ah, he's not legitimate. And that's one of the reasons that Paul had in some of his letters to say, here are my credentials, here's my resume. This is, this is the authenticity that demonstrates that I am indeed legitimate as an apostle of Christ. And if anybody ought to know that, the Corinthians ought to know that. Because of what he had done when he was there, that he was the one who began the work in Corinth, and he had demonstrated apostolic authority there. Second Corinthians 12, verses 11 and 12. I have become foolish, you yourselves compelled me. Actually, I should have been commended by you, for in no respect was I inferior to the most eminent apostles, even though I am a nobody. The signs of a true apostle were performed among you, with all perseverance, by signs and wonders and miracles. So Paul not only says, I had the revelation of the gospel of Jesus Christ from the Lord, not from men. I saw the Lord Jesus. I'm qualified to be an apostle. I'm a witness of the resurrected Lord. And he also says, and besides that, I've done the signs and wonders that demonstrate the reality of my authority, of my apostleship in Jesus Christ. So if someone claims to be an apostle, okay, and the word is used in more than one sense. We're going to touch on that a little bit in the book of Acts. But if someone claims to be an apostle of Jesus Christ, they need to have seen the Lord, to be a, a witness of his resurrection. They need to have the signs of apostleship, which Paul says include the signs and wonders and miracles, the sort of things that he did in Corinth and in Ephesus and in Lystra and in various other places. And that door, that window of opportunity, I'm pretty sure it's closed. Uh, I'm more than pretty sure. I'm completely confident that that window of opportunity for Apostles of Jesus Christ is completely closed, that that work has been done. Uh, Paul makes reference to that in Ephesians 2.20 when he talks about the church being built on 
the foundation of the apostles and prophets, with Jesus Christ as the chief cornerstone, uh, that this was a foundational work, and the building rises from there, from the work that they were doing. But Paul was part of that, part of that foundational work. He was an apostle of Jesus Christ, and in being called to be an apostle, Paul was called to, certainly, true discipleship, to take up his cross and follow Jesus. In Luke chapter 14, Jesus said to some who were following him, Luke chapter 14, verses 25 through 27, large crowds were traveling with Jesus, and turning to them, he said, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, his wife and children, his brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. And anyone who does not carry his cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. Well, those demands, that's a, that's a pretty high bar, the demands of discipleship. To write off family, to write off everything else, write off even your life in order to follow Jesus. Well, some of his chosen apostles said to him, not exactly on this occasion, but shortly after this, Lord, we left everything to follow you. And Jesus agreed, they had. They had given up everything to follow him. Well, Jesus asked everyone that wants to be his disciple to give up their very lives and follow him. We had a citation a couple of days ago of Galatians 2 and 20. I am crucified with Christ, Paul said. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ lives in me. In the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Paul said of himself, I die daily. He faced death constantly, literally and in a figure of speech, because every day he woke up willing to pursue the cause of Christ no matter what the cost, no matter what it would cost him. Now when Jesus says, take up your cross daily, he's not talking about, you know, a full-blown cross. The consensus is, and I think this is true, that this consensus is probably right here, that what he's talking about is the cross piece. You'd have a vertical member that was kept in place. You wouldn't plant that every single time a crucifixion took place at a scene of execution. You'd have a vertical post, and then there would be a cross piece that would be brought up into place there, lifted with ropes and pulleys into place there. And uh, the person being crucified, as is the story of Jesus, was generally compelled to carry that to the place of execution. Now, Jesus failed to carry it, right? Because he had already been so severely abused and beaten and was so thoroughly exhausted that he simply could not carry that. And they compelled a man named Joseph from Cyrene to carry that piece for him out to the place of crucifixion, anticipating and having that imagery in mind, which all those Jews would identify with, because they'd seen crucifixions. Now, that that form of punishment passed out of use some 1,500 years ago, and uh, the, the knowledge of it kind of passed out of existence as well, but we've, done, we've had enough in terms of research and archaeology and ancient manuscripts and so forth to have a pretty good idea of what went on there. And, and Jesus says, you know, take this load as though you're going out there to the place where you're going to die. Bear this load and follow me. Take up your cross and follow me. Now, Paul did. Paul took up his cross and followed Jesus. He had repudiated the crucified Lord, and now he took up his cross and followed Jesus. The Lord said to Ananias, Acts 9, 15, 16, this is before Ananias went. The Lord said to Ananias, Go, this man is my chosen instrument to carry my name before the Gentiles and their kings and before the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. So the day Paul became a Christian, the day that Ananias baptized him, the day that he received the Holy Spirit along with receiving a restoration of his sight, that day the Lord told him, the Lord showed him, whether the words of Ananias are in a visionary way, I'm not completely sure. But that day, the Lord showed him, this is going to be costly for you. There's going to be suffering, a lot of suffering involved for you in being my disciple. And what did Paul do? Did he say, ah, oh, not going to sign on for this? No, he didn't. He was compelled. He was The compulsion was upon him to do whatever he did, could do to undo the harm that he had already done to do his best for the sake of Christ after having done his best to destroy the name and followers of the Lord Jesus. I will show him how much you must suffer for my name. How'd you like to have that handed to you on the day of your baptism? This is what it's going to cost you to be a Christian in terms of your friends, your family, your, your career, your job, your potentials for your life, in terms of the culture that you live in. This is what it's going to cost you to be a, to be a Christian. Well, Paul was given a rundown, some kind of an insight 
into how much he would suffer for the name of Jesus. And, I, and when I read the stories of Paul and Acts, and when I read what, what Paul brings up and reminds us of in his letters, it was an ordeal. It was a struggle. It was real hardship that he signed on for. And he did it with enthusiasm. And he did it with joy. And he did it with contentment. Although some of those things had to be learned in the process, according to his own words. In Acts chapter 20, verses 22 through 24, when Paul was talking to the Ephesian elders, he says, Now compelled by the Spirit, I am going to Jerusalem, not knowing what will happen to me there. Now, if we went on with other things that are said in regard to this, we would find that Paul is not saying, I don't have a choice here. He wasn't saying, the Spirit says, go, in terms of a command. He's saying that he saw that there was benefit by the Spirit of God he was going. He was compelled, not in the sense of force, but in the sense that he believed this was what God would, would really approve of him doing. Because his friends challenge him along the way. Don't go, Paul, don't go. And he says, no, I'm, I'm going. Even if I die in Jerusalem, I'm still going to go. But it wasn't whether he had the liberty to do something else. It was the sense of duty that he had. So he was compelled by the Spirit. Compelled by the Spirit, I'm going to Jerusalem, not knowing what will happen to me there. I only know that in every city, the Holy Spirit warns me that prison and hardships are facing me. <coughs> However, I consider my life worth nothing to me if only I may finish the race and complete the task. Remember what Paul says at the end of 2 Timothy when he is indeed in the midst of trial before Nero? And he says, what did he say about finishing the race? I have finished the race. I, I've, I've done now what I set out to do. I have finished the race. Yeah. He has fought the good fight. I consider my life worth nothing to me if only I may finish the race and complete the task the Lord Jesus has given me. The task of testifying to the gospel of God's grace. Again, this fundamental idea of God's gift to mankind, the good news of Jesus Christ, testifying to the gospel of God's grace. Paul was willing to die for what he had killed others for. He was willing to die for the gospel that he had previously condemned in the lives of others. 2 Timothy chapter 3, where again we have this uh, the uh, some personal accounting by Paul reminding Timothy. Where was Timothy from? Well, Paul encounters him in Lystra, he, and is on his what's called the second journey in the 16th chapter of Acts. Paul goes up to Derby and then to Lystra, and at Lystra he encounters a young man named Timothy, who's well spoken of by the brethren in Lystra and Iconium, which is more or less 20 miles apart. And he wanted to take him along. And so now when Paul writes to Timothy, Timothy is from the area of Lystra and Iconium, which when we shortly, not today, but shortly we'll be looking at the story of Paul's travels through there. Um, Timothy was aware of Paul's experiences there a few years earlier. You, however, know all about my teaching, my way of life, my purpose, faith, patience, love, endurance, persecution, sufferings, what kinds of things happened to me in Antioch, Iconium, and Lystra, the persecutions I endured? Yet the Lord rescued me from all of them. Well, what was one of the ones he endured in Lystra? Stoning. They stoned him until they thought he was dead. And then the brethren, the believers, came and gathered around, they thought, gathered around his body, and he got up and walked back into the city, and the next day walked on from Lystra for Derby, which was by road about 80 miles away. But... Uh, you know what I endured in Iconium? You know what I endured in Lystra? You know what I endured in Antioch? This is Antioch of the city, and not the Antioch where uh, his home church was. But we have accounts there of trials, of persecution of Jews that followed him from town to town in order to incite violence against him. And he reminds Timothy, you know about those things. Because he wants Timothy to remember that the cause is greater than the circumstances that the purpose is greater than the, uh, the events that take place along the way on the road to the goal. It started in Damascus, and that's where I'll start my next session sometime tomorrow. Uh, Acts chapter 9, 19 through 25, tomorrow afternoon, I think. Um, Paul, with the preaching of the gospel in Damascus and in Jerusalem and so on and so forth, going on into his experiences in Antioch and uh, traveling in Asia Minor. So pick up the story on there. You've got 10 minutes. Okay.